Hello and welcome back to Echo. We're picking up right after uh, Flynn, Carl, and Daxton found uh, Chase still locked up in the reading room of the, what is it, City Hall? Yeah. Anyways, let's see what the commotion is outside. We exit City Hall and are instantly greeted by a slew of faces. This is a lot of fresh shit, you know that? What do you mean when you say we can't leave? Everyone seems to be gathered around the front entrance, the headlights from half a dozen cars lighting up as we exit. Most eyes are on Auntie. The air has this sort of smoky tinge to it, like someone's cooking something. I wonder if it's from the fire I saw earlier. You all come here because you wanted answers? Now you're going to listen to me or not? I recognize most of the people in the crowd. Janice. Duke, Kutsu, Micah, Heather, Mark, and shit, about a dozen more. Some of them look downright terrified. Others like Micah, the klepto shithead from Tetanus Alley, just looks pissed and agitated by whatever hell Auntie is saying. I can see Duke, the old widower who lives next to Leo, somewhere back by his car. He's not looking at my aunt anymore. He's fixated on Chase with a sort of thousand yard stare. From the back of the crowd, I see the lumbering figure of Leo. At sight of us, he pushes his way through. Chase! Leo stops, rubbing the back of his neck, looking off to the side as he notes the otter's state of undress. You're back, and you're naked. Chase has this weird sort of look on his face, like he's never seen Leo before in his life. Like this is some incredibly awkward encounter with a stranger. Uh, yeah, Black Widow bit me. And that made you naked? Leo turns, looking at me suspiciously. Fuck you, I didn't do it. God, I have no time for this shit anymore. Leo's brows furrow. I keep expecting him to jolt out his arms and slug me, but he just looks tired and confused. I sat in the nest of a whole bunch of them and they got everywhere. That's awful. Are you alright? Leo brings his large paw up to Chase's shoulder. Chase flinches and the wolf quickly releases his grasp, giving the otter a quizzical look. I'm okay. Well, not really, but you know. He rubs the bite area on his neck, biting his cheek as he stares at the gravel between his feet. I don't know, Chase. We need to get you to a doctor. But I have to ask, why'd you run off earlier? I... I didn't mean to. I just did. Chase, that doesn't make any sense, yeah? Auntie begins to speak again. Let's talk plain like. Most of you have seen things, bad things. And some folks around here have started acting real strange, more so than the usual suspects on their bouts with the happy juice. And nobody's getting any tower or satellite signals for the phones and internet. Landline's fuzzy too. A couple of people nod. Micah now looks over his shoulder, seemingly unfocused on what Auntie is saying. Mark tried to get off to Peyton to see if the county offices knew what was going on. He got about as far as Flint, turn off before he found himself on the old Route 65 leading back into town. He tells me he tried three times to get through. No luck. Now I would have slapped him on the head with a roll of newspaper and told him to take his clowning to the circus if I hadn't heard the same sort of thing from my grandpa decades ago. Folks traveling in buggies trying to escape the madness of this town, but they got snared in one hell of a web. If you've been thinking your dreams have been getting real queer, like, as of late, you ain't alone. It's been getting worse. Honestly, I was packing my bags to get out of here before it hit. I wasn't ready to leave. I remember telling Auntie I wanted to stay for Carl's interview, but I wanted to also see if I could get to the bottom of the shit with TJ too. So you're saying there's no way out? That we're in an, an escapable bubble? Sweetheart, it's like this tide. It goes in, it's pulled out. And sometimes it pulls stuff with it. My grandpa, God rest his soul, told me it was attracted to the uncouthness of man, the ears and desires with which we cannot unshackle ourselves. Simple sin. A mournful look crosses her face and she takes a deep breath. Mark, 
She looks over to the horned toad, our town's treasurer. He's standing by his black four-door SUV. I always made fun of him for, for buying it. Black cars in the desert ain't a good mix unless you're keen on baking. He reaches into the car and pulls out a lumpy something wrapped in a flamboyantly colored beach towel. I recognize the faded logo in the corner as one of the Southwestern Adventures, an old souvenir maybe. Mark herks as he steps in front of the mayor with it, setting it on the ground. The first thing I see are the feet sticking out from the end. Someone in the back, Heather, I think, screams. It's a banshee-like wail as Mark pulls back the fabric. No! Keith! It's not Keith. At first, it's difficult to tell exactly what I'm looking at, but after a few moments, I can see clearly who it is. That's... that's Salem. Keith! Jesus. No. TJ begins to sob, his terrified sniffles mixing with Heather's confused, shrill cries. The boar is covered in lacerations, most of which are on his face. Two swipes of whatever cut him seem to have torn his eyes and part of his snout out. I always thought that when someone had their eyes taken out, it'd just be black holes inside, but it's pink. It's like I'm looking into this guy's brain. I feel like I'm gonna hurl. What, what happened to him? He tried to leave. Yeah, but how did that happen? The raccoon, who up to this point I've never seen as anything but the strong, silent type, looks shaken up bad. He clutches his forehead with a paw, shaking his head. God, for a second, he looked like... he looked like somebody else. I barely know Salem. He's a recent move-in, who originally squatted on a vacant land in an RV until the landowner started making him pay to live there. He kept to himself, never even said two words to the guy. That's an accomplishment when you're stuck in a town with just about 50 people still living here. Mark tells me that the third time he tried to leave, he saw him just laying there on the side of the road next to his RV. Dead as a doorknob. So, to answer your question, coon boy, I don't know. These things always end, but there's no clear definition of when or how. I advise, as I do with all trying times, to turn to the higher powers. Pray and repent as you may. There's a shocked silence from those present. Daxon keeps shaking his head. Jenna tries her phone again. Micah stares off into the dark in the direction of the highway. I know how we make these visions stop. The weasel steps up to Auntie, though he's not looking at her. Yeah, what's your proposal, Duke? He points a pink finger towards Chase. We stop him. Chase sort of half blinks his bloodshot eyes aimed all unfocused like at the scruffy weasel. What? I can't discern who that voice came from. This has all happened before. He looks towards Auntie, who nods inquisitively. And it's only gonna get worse. It happened to my great-granddaddy, my daddy, and now it's happening to me. Well, me and the rest of y'alls. Dale's missing, Cynthia drove off into the desert, Clint and Jeremy are all running around, shooting and screaming at nothing. Thing is, we've all got something after us, something bad. Won't let you leave when it starts. What's after you? The raspy voice bat chimes in, still looking off into the desert, away from the crowd. Duke's quiet for a moment, rolling a handmade cigarette between his thumb and index finger. It's always triggered by something. Duke begins to pace, still pointing at Chase. I seen you here last week, before all the rest of your little friends showed up. Late at night, outside his house. He nods in Leo's direction, the wolf clasping Chase's shoulder protectively. Just standing there. For hours and hours. I didn't even need to be asleep to see ya. The last line rings strange, Duke saying it as if it makes perfect sense. Chase's gaze shifts to his feet, his legs beginning to tremble. Hey. I'm not saying you did it, or that you were wanting this all to happen. He steps over Salem's body, approaching the otter. 
It's just that you gotta know something, anything that we can use to stop this. Because anytime I ask big old Leo here, he just got his glazed look in his eyes, telling me where I can stick my inquiries. That, that doesn't make sense. Well, uh, my, uh, something, someone told me that you would know. It's at this point, I see the black metallic shape sticking out from the back of the weasel's trousers. He's got a gun. Daxton flinches, seeing it too. Oh shit! He mutters, and I feel Carl step closer against me. Who? who? Someone I know! He yells, leaning in closer to Chase. Leo steps completely in front of him, ears down with his fangs bared. It makes sense. Something bad happens, and if you don't fix it, it won't stop coming after you. Maybe for you. Leo snarls, turn into a light, tepid frown. He looks unnerved, uneasy with Duke and what he's saying. This is all real timely with your friends showing up. So what happened, Chase? I don't know what you're talking about. Auntie exchanges a glance with Mark. Then they both look at Chase, seemingly unconcerned that Duke is packing. Things are getting worse out here, and unless we do something, we're all going to end up like young Salem. Duke's voice is dead and distant. He's right. Auntie's voice cuts through the air like a knife. Next thing I know, her and Mark are stepping up beside Duke. Flynn, come here. My heart lurches at hearing my name called, and I strain myself to keep a straight face. I'm trying not to look at the body as I walk up, feeling my backside illuminated by dozens of headlights and the gaze of the crowd. You lock Chase in the reading room with all them spiders. Why? You what? Didn't know about the spiders at the time. I mumble. Flynn? She looks away for a moment. Pretty sure he killed Sydney. I clutch my head, the blood in my veins feeling cold. It's as if the gravel beneath my feet is churning to quicksand. My mouth moves as if to say more but I managed to bite my tongue. This just makes the pain worse. What the fuck is happening? I can see Jenna covering her face with both paws, seemingly in disbelief this is really happening. There's a few murmurs from the gathering. Micah looks back at us, seemingly distracted from whatever it was in the desert that he was staring at. You're talking about your little friend who drowned in the lake a decade ago? Yeah. Wow, kid. He clicks his tongue, shaking his head at the bedraggled, looking otter. That's fucked up. Chase starts to look like TJ again, as if on the urge of breaking down into sobs. He seems to be altering from angry, sad, and confused over and over again. This ain't right how you guys are handling this, yeah? Duke, Flynn, Mayor Lady, you really need to fuck off. We'll handle this. I don't reckon I believe that. Sid died like 10 years ago. This doesn't make any fucking sense. Well, this sort of murder happened before. My grandpa lived through the whole thing and stayed in the town after. Yeah, yeah, that's right. That happened weeks after the body was found. Auntie rubs her thumb through her floor scarf, staring into the headlights of one of the old jeeps. The one in the mines. The air got all electric and fuzzy. Folks went out of their heads. She's never talked about any of this before. How do you know that? Brett gabbed about it a lot when you were a young'un, and before you were born. Dad. The whole superstition was part of the justification for making the library and booking it. Well that, and one other reason. I tried to ignore the last comment, still focusing on the increasingly tense stare down between Leo, Chase, and Duke. I had heard Mom and Dad hated Echo, mainly the usual grumblings about godlessness. Any ailment they had were surely the fucking results of some latent sin. Point is, the ground beneath our feet is tainted soil, rotten, shaky, loam. Duke interrupts, but Auntie doesn't seem to mind. She's just frowning now, looking at the crowd of people. Her scarves come undone due to all the fidgeting, and all the old scarves she had beneath are visible. Tattered scales replaced with pink flesh. It's more rotten in some places, you know the ones. My grandpappy thought that, because they didn't catch the murderer, it planted some seeds in the bad dirt. But that ain't true. Duke rubs at the scab along his forehead, 
squeezing his cigarette so hard that the ash starts pouring out the other side like toothpaste. They caught him, right? And then everything was okay for a while after they found him. And he was killed. What the fuck does that have to do with Sydney? Duke continues, ignoring me. So, I don't know what it was, if it was murder or guilt or not catching someone that did wrong. I shake my head. I can't believe this shit. Sid's not fucking haunting the town, you meth-addled cunt. But it started when you got here, so you gotta forgive me for wondering if one of you did something bad. He was a fucking nine-year-old and brought that guilt back to this poison land to grow the seed again. Duke doesn't sound like himself at all, not even his recently crazed self. Still though, I don't want to admit it. I have an idea of what Duke might be getting at. How this all fits into our history. And judging from the look on the gathered crowd's faces, the feeling appears mutual. There's murmured inquiries about what to do. Heather is still quietly sobbing, asking her group of people who ignore her why no one's helping Keith. Genevieve Sanders, a retired mail carrier from Peyton, mentions something about a lynching. Jenna's arms are crossed tight, her expression this sort of furrowed, indignant stare that slowly falters to upset confusion. TJ's next to her, one paw on her arm. I can barely hear him, but he keeps saying he's sorry over and over. Leo begins to tug at Chase, pulling him back in the direction of the van. The two begin to hurriedly walk before Auntie speaks up. Stop. I always had this niggling desire, this idea of getting justice for what happened. Sid deserved as much, but now, I can't say I'm feeling any catharsis or joy. Just this hollow rumbling from my insides that this ain't right. This can't be how we fix shit. Carl has his head down now, the ram acting small despite his burly proportions. I just want to move besides him, tuck him under my arm, and fuck off far away from here. Get back here! Leo shakes his head. We're not sticking around for your shitty speeches. We're leaving. Chase needs a doctor. Come on, guys. He makes a beckoning motion to us. Jenna quickly shoves her phone into her purse, the Fennec visibly trying not to look at the body as she, TJ, Carl, and Dax head to the van. Just as I start to join them, I hear a clicking noise to my side. The horrible noise is deafening. I clutch my sides of my head and crouch down. A brass shell casing falls and hits my leg. It's hot. Duke's pointing his pistol into the air. Our group stops in their tracks, TJ falling to the ground and covering his face. Heather is shrieking, screaming over and over again. And then suddenly, she stops. There's some flailing of movement from the group that was standing near her, like the dancing you see at a rave. When I look again, I can't see her anymore. Mike is gone too. Him and a few others scattered. I can faintly see the bat's silhouette in the distance, sprinting into the desert. What the fuck, Duke? I scream at the weasel. Needed to get their attention for the mayor, yeah. That's no fucking excuse. That shot could have come back down and killed somebody. Duke clutches a pistol limply in his grasp, seemingly uncaring of where he's pointing the loaded gun as he twirls his wrist around. It's a bit late for that now. Folks would have been hurt already. And they'll continue to get hurt till we stop this. I hear shouts of agreement from the remaining crowd. Auntie just nods, and I can't help but give her a dumbfounded look. I clutch my repeater close. Spiders. Spiders got him, not right, Flynn? She points to Chase. Yeah, he sat in a nest of them. Duke? She holds up a finger, fast walking back into the office without another word. Duke watches our group by the van. Everyone's quiet. His pistol is aimed up at the sky. After a minute, she returns with a piece of faded paper clutched in her hands. There's some old-timey writing on both sides of it. She holds it up to Mark and Duke. Mark uses his cell phone as a light as they begin to read. Duke lowers his gun. I can see Jenna moving by the edge of the van. She's motioning towards me, then Duke. What does she want me to do? Disarm him? One quick chop of the wrist? That'll do it, I guess. I'll have to drop my repeater, though. I don't really want to risk that. At least, not yet. Surprisingly, Chase speaks up. What's it say? Boy, I think you know what it says. You were rooting through our stuff and plucking at these records Thursday. James Hendricks, notice of death. 
Carl visibly stiffens. Guess what killed them? Spiders. I step up, squinting at the paper. It's a notice of death, all right, for reference in an estate transfer. It's for a James Hendricks, who passed away in 1913. The cause of death is listed as poison, infection, thoracosidae, tarantula. Tarantula. Chase shifts uncomfortably. Chase's ass got planted on some black widows. And what does Carl's old great whatever have to do with this? James Hendricks I was a notorious sodomite like Chase. I sigh. What? You say he was looking at this the other day? He's working on a school project. Hell, that's why he's here. So he claimed. You sure about that? Auntie seems to pry at my own niggling doubt. I look back at the pathetic looking otter. He looks to me. And then Dax steps up. Hey, uh... He stops just short of the body on the ground. Daxton straightens his posture, folding his arms behind his back. Mr. Duke, I, I think you're making a lot of really interesting headway into how we can solve this. You know, much better than just hiding out in our houses from rampant chaos and the like. But uh, Salem here, he uneasily gestures towards the corpse on the towel, the boar's hollow eye sockets still staring at the stars above. Whatever got him, I think stopping slash avoiding, that should be priority number one. Because, I mean, I've only known Chase about half a week, but he doesn't seem like the sort to be capable of all this. Kid, I've known Chase all my life, and I'd reckon something similar. But at the end of the day, Chase didn't do this. It's what Chase did that did this. This town needs justice. How that little kid Sydney needs justice. I'm just gonna save y'all. And make it so that she leaves me alone once and for all. Who leaves you alone? Duke doesn't respond, instead raising his pistol. I can't tell who he's aiming at. His paws are shaky. I need to do something. Jesus fuck. I... I stand there, and I can see Jenna besides the van looking at me pleadingly. Auntie's peering at me now, a strange look on her face. This isn't right. I should do something. My head is killing me. Something is wrong. And at the worst possible fucking time, I grip my teeth concentrating on what's really happening. Duke says something, and I can't quite make out what Daxton stammers back a retort. I've had a vision of Chase too, but nothing points towards it as a conclusion. Leo slides Chase behind him, the wolf's ears pinned to the side of his head. Despite the throbbing pain, I manage to pull up my gun and aim it at Duke. Drop it, fucker. Flynn! Let him die! Someone in the crowd yells. Fuck you! I ain't gonna kill him, Flynn. He just needs to stay put. If the spider's bite get him, then that's fate. And if he doesn't stay put, I'll make him stay put. The fuck you will, put the gun down. Duke just stares ahead at the otter, pistol still raised. Daxton holds up his hands, ultimately stepping to the side and out of the line of fire. You don't need to do- th I said, drop it! Why won't you fucking listen to me? Duke says nothing. Do it! I see the weasel exhale, traces of smoke leave his nostrils and dissipate into the hazy air. Slowly, his wrist goes limp, and he lowers his arm to his side. I step over and knock the gun out of his paw. You're dooming us, kid, and your friend's gonna get away with murder. I scoff. The fuck he will. Now shut up. We're leaving. Auntie moves over besides me, resting her hand on my shoulder. Flynn, you can't make the decision for everyone. There's nothing wrong with you. I can't believe you entertained this fucking meth head's proposal. I used to think you were a good person, you know? But fuck that, which trial it is. I spit on the ground. Auntie lowers her head and begins to fidget with her scarf, her gaze shifting downcast. I used to think the Moors were immune to all this sordid business. But I don't think you are. Not anymore. But be careful, Flynn. She turns, walking back towards Mark, who is busy re-wrapping Salem's body, bringing him inside. It's rare to see her look so uneasy, trying to run a shit town like Echo. You get a thick skin for shit crumbling around you, but nothing like this. Leo quickly helps Chase into the van and the rest of the gang follows. 
Sunday. I stare into the rearview mirror, watching for any signs of tail lights in our wake. Leo's driving, of course. Carl's feeling woozy after everything that happened. I wish I was sitting in the back with him, but unfortunately, my legs are too long. That and Leo's van is clearly not designed for folks with thick tails, so I gotta sit with my cheeks straddled at the edge to make room. He's sitting in between Jenna and TJ with Dax and Chase in the back. There's been some chatter about what happened and what's bullshit and not bullshit. TJ is the only one who's been quiet. Though one thing is for certain, with everything that's happened, everyone seems pretty focused on getting out of town. Leo doesn't floor it like I expect him to, but we move down the bench of the mountain and through the town speedily enough. I see Jenna looking out her own window intently, and I can only imagine if she's trying to spot Jeremy, maybe even her mother. Dude, I don't feel good. Chase got bit by a black widow, and he's been complaining less than you, Carl. Speaking of, how are you holding up, Otter? Chase gives a half-hearted thumbs up, the muscleed's forehead resting against the side of the window. Carl, just puke on the floor if you have to. I don't think Leo's gonna stop. Carl leans over and puts his head between his knees, groaning. That gets TJ's attention and he starts rubbing the ram's back slowly. Good thing smoothies probably aren't too bad on the way out. TJ frowns. I turn the dial on the radio, but like the cell phone signal, it's not getting anything. For now, I just turn up the AC and aim it up towards my face. My head's still throbbing up a storm. This feels like a dream, doesn't it? Leo speaks softly, too quiet for anyone behind us to hear. I wouldn't know. You locked Chase in a spider-infested room, then lied to us about it. I sigh, crossing my forearms over the dashboard and leaning my face into them. I'm not in the mood for this shit, Leo. And then you risk your life to save him. Like, with a gun and everything, straight out of a scene from those westerns we used to watch. Paint and Access Channel, remember? Scooter guy back there reminded me of Deputy Jack from Tumbleweed Armadillo with his whole speech. I crane my head up a little, raising a brow at the wolf. He seems pretty focused on the road. Daxon and Chase are muttering about something in the back of the van, but I can't make any of it out. But why? I mean, you could have finally gotten your revenge or whatever, yeah? It's hard to read the wolf's expression. He's certainly different from his previous bullshit persona of the cheery spring break patriarch. He seems old, way older than he actually is. Fucking hell, Leo, I don't want Chase dead. My tone comes out more tired and exasperated than genuinely angry. I just want the truth. Leo lets out a large breath through his nostrils, then slightly nods. Yeah, to be honest, I didn't even think about Sydney when I set this all up, you know? Of course you didn't. Leo never really was one to dwell much on Sydney's death, except saying he'd protect the rest of us because of what happened. Basically said shit was fucked up enough already, so you might as well try to stay positive and cherish what you've got now. What he had was an otter's ass, so I'm pretty sure that made it easier. There's a long pause. And... Hmm? I rubbed the back of my frilled head. Never mind. Nothing. Hmm. Another long silence. Dax gives Chase a bottle of water and Carl starts to play a game on his phone. A few minutes later, we're already passing the lake. Huh, so it's... it's Sunday already? Sunday morning? That's what the clock says. What a fucking day. I don't say anything in response. We never got to ask Glanzons about the... the thing. We could always go back and ask. What? No, I just... He's kidding, TJ. Oh. Felding stares at the space between his knees. Do you actually think she'd know anything about it, Flynn? I don't know. She and Mark knew enough about what happened with the body, though. Kyle shivers and puts his head back down while TJ continues to rub his back. A few minutes of silence go by before Carl speaks up again. That feels kind of nice. Reminds me of my mom. Yeah, actually, my mom did that too. Thought it might help. Hey, I love you. Just so you know, all of you guys, I'm glad we're getting out of here. Fuck it, I'm going back to Pueblo. I raise a brow ridge at the ram. And I'm taking you with me. 
He points a thick finger towards me, leaning forward enough that he pokes me in the shoulder. I restrain a smile, instead letting out an idle grunt. Me? College? What a thought. The idea of being around guys my age, and Carl. I'm not even sure what the hell I'd major in. Definitely not fucking poli -sci. I squeeze my wrist, trying to focus. I love you too, Carl, and everyone else. You too, Captain Daxton. Captain? Oh, I was promoted? Cool. Daxton seems distracted, watching Chase stare at his own fingertips. Yeah. Chase affirms his love for everyone with a groggy monotone. Jenna glances back at them before turning her attention out of her own window. Leo doesn't say anything from the front, his focus solely on the road ahead of him. Are we at the clinic yet? Still about 20 minutes out. I watch the desert whip by us, for the first time feeling somewhat safe as the town disappears behind us. But of course, it doesn't last long. What's that? On the side of the road there? Hmm? Leo turns his head in the direction of something on the curb up ahead. We all do. What is that? Oh my gosh! TJ covers his mouth. Carl sits up straight, trying to see. Leo slows down as we pass. There's Chase's car, all the windows shattered. And there's Duke, lying a dozen feet away from the open door of the driver's side. And there, crouching over him, is something I can't explain. Hairless, body and limbs long. Way too long. The head comes up and all I see are three holes and blood. TJ screams next to me and Leo shouts something back before stepping on the gas, slamming me back into my seat. I try to look back, but whatever it was is gone. At least, it's gone from where it was, because I see something moving next to my window and I turn to face it. And it stares back at me. But only for a moment. That... that thing, whatever the fuck it is, disappears almost the instant I register that it's there. I'm only staring out into the blackness of the desert. Still, three holes, eyes, and a mouth blink back at me in the sort of afterimage before it that too vanishes. It's him! It's him! It's him! It's him! TJ reaches up and grabs my arm, claws out. I'm too shocked to even pull away as TJ leans forward next to me, staring out my window. At least, I know I'm not the only one that saw it. TJ squeaks again when no one answers him. It's real! I don't know, s some kind of animal, maybe? I've never seen anything like that before. Dude could have had a disease, lost all of its fur, or something. Maybe Duke hid it. But it was walking! How is Duke here? He was back at City Hall. Maybe it dragged him? Faster than our car? How do you get Chase's car? I, I still have my keys on me. That's impossible. Could have hotwired it. I don't know, man. TJ leans back, looping his arm around Carl's, and I can see him shaking. I look over my shoulder to the back window. Jesus fuck, just like Dax described. There, we've all seen it. It's how I remember, but I don't remember it ever moving that fast. Or with, you know, blood. Jenna rings her paws together, speaking quietly. Her tone is thoughtful and worried, as if she's trying to rationalize this all to herself. Fuck, that's what got Salem, isn't it? Jesus, don't fucking take your foot off the gas, Leo. Leo doesn't respond, staring hard ahead. He's squeezing on the wheel so hard it looks like he's bending. I pull back the hammer on the repeater, holding the rifle across my chest with barrel pointed towards the window. I remember Duke's pistol that I stowed in the car door, holder earlier. I grab it and toss it to the back seat. Jenna grabs it without hesitation, aiming out the opposite window. This is freaking nuts! At this point, Chase's car is a good distance away, only visible because the headlights are on, a streak of light fading out across the desert. Duke's dead, isn't he? Blur. Some dry, retching noises followed by a heavy, splattering sound cuts me off. Carl is hunched over his seat, head between his legs. It isn't hard to figure out what just happened, especially when the smell hits me. Oh my gosh, Carl! TJ looks torn between blanching away and comforting the ram. Carl comes back up, looking like he's about to say something before diving forward again. A much louder wretch, followed by a much quieter plopping sound follows. I grimace, feeling my own stomach roll. God. 
Daxton looks up at them, a paw up to his nose. Are you okay, man? Carl keeps his head down a while longer, his fingers twisting into the fabric of his shorts. TJ tentatively rubs his back. I... I would have done it out the window. I don't want to open any of the windows now, though. It's okay. Leo, are there any napkins up there? Leo, who's still silent up to now, remains silent. He's staring out the windshield hard, paws on the wheel in a death grip. Chase, meanwhile, is clutching at his chest, his eyes red and bleary. He leans forward, and the sound of something wet hitting the fabric doormat is audible through the cabin. Chase's puke sound, much less wetter than Carl's, the retching more grotesque. I can practically feel the bile in my own esophagus. Jackson stops what he's doing and holds Chase. Fuck. The otter manages to exclaim in between the bouts of puking. Drink some water. During all of this, I'm still glancing out the windows. Not head on, though, because I'm honestly fucking terrified that I'm going to look straight into those eyes again. We drive in silence for the next five minutes with no creature in sight, thankfully. But I don't know what to think right now. There's no way what I saw was some animal like Carl implied. The way it moved, the way it was crouched, and most of all, its face. I've never seen anything like it, at least anything that's not a Halloween costume. Maybe, maybe one of those locals dressed up in a costume or something. Is this some sort of shitty prank show, like the ones on the science fiction channel? But then how the fuck did they keep up with the car? Were we going that fast? Leo did slow down a little. I keep these thoughts to myself. Everyone looks freaked out enough without any more speculation. I feel trapped, like I'm stuck in a metal box that I can barely move in with a gun I can't aim. If this thing can outrun and rip at cars, nothing is safe. I just have to focus. We're on our way out, and soon I'll be safe in a clinic, police station, or an applauding audience surrounded by a shit ton of cameras. If it's the latter, I'm decking the first fucker that comes out with a microphone. I try not to think about Duke by the car, Salem on the blanket, my aunt out there trying to keep everyone safe. With that thing. I shake my head, trying to watch for any sign of movement. Are you okay, Chase? TJ's arms are still around Carl's, the lynx is craning his neck, to peer back at the hunched over otter. I've never been so freaking scared in my life, but yeah, I'm okay. Chase grasps at his throat and neck, wincing heavily. It's getting harder to breathe. Hold on, Chase. No, how can... What? The car lurches as Leo slows down again. I squint my eyes, attempting to peer past the glare of headlights, reach and into the darkness beyond. But I don't see anything, just the road stretching ahead of us. From the back seat, Chase's croaking, high-pitched voice pipes up. What's wrong? Leo's quiet for a moment. His face is blank, ears twitching. I don't. Leo turns in his seat, looking out the passenger window, then his own. I'm heading the right way, right? Why do we stop? TJ sounds panicked, the lynx turning around in his seat as he stares out the back window. It's the first time I've seen him in a car without his seatbelt on. Leo goes silent. A look of befuddlement crosses his red and white muzzle. He's looking into the mountains that surround Echo Canyon. We aren't... Look! Jenna scoots forward on the edge of her seat, pointing at something outside. The hills! Those were on the right side a while ago. We must have looped around. But we've been going straight this whole time. The only way we'd be going back this way is if we got turned around when we hit the main highway. But we haven't hit the main highway, have we? Chase presses his fur cheeks against the window, his tired eyes bulging. What in the... the goddamn? He trails off. So we just seemingly transition from going one way to the other without any us, of us noticing? No, Leo must have gotten off and turned around on the side of the road that I... There's no way, I just... While trying to lean forward to get a better look at the mountains, Leo's apple pushes down on the horn. TJ gasps, digging his claws into the fabric of his seat. Please don't do that! It was an accident, I swear. Okay, just... let's be quiet, okay? Leo, we're going the wrong way. Jenna speaks as calmly as possible, clearly aware that the tension in here is getting increasingly high. Leo brings the car to a hard stop, throwing me forward into this, my seatbelt. Then he does a quick three-point turn, shoving me right, then left, then I'm smacked back into the seat as Leo accelerates again. 
I hear a soft thunk of flesh on glass, then a groan from the back. Chase is rubbing his face with a sore-looking nose. Injury upon injury. Sorry, Chase. You okay? No. He responds back hoarsely, sinking back further into the scratchy fabric of his seat. Oh, same. Daxon does a curt nod. The wolf clutches, the steering wheel with an iron grip. We both stare out the windshield, eyes to the horizon. Nobody says anything for a while. Even in the silence, I can feel the growing unease from those behind us, the trembling of muscles and clicking of claws. I'm trying to block it out, to just focus on watching what's ahead. All things considered, it's not so bad as long as I can keep my fear from clouding my mind. Though, that could be said about most things in life. We just have to keep driving to get out of this fucking town. We can't get sidetracked again, especially with that fucking eyeless thing around. I wonder if it hurt the horn earlier. I focus on the mountains now, making sure that they don't disappear. They slope up and down gently under the moonlight, speckled with the dark spots of rock and vegetation. Vaguely, I remember back when I was younger, leading Sydney around the bend and entertaining his explorer fantasies. I brought my BB gun, and he'd run around shooting at mesquite trees and looking for signs of lost native treasure. I told him that the pioneers thought that there was a city of gold buried beneath the mountain top soil, waiting to be unearthed. He fucking loved that, even brought a little trench shovel to, as he put it, dig his own mine. Pretty sure he thought that there was a whole reason for Echo's old mine to find the city and shit. It wasn't a complete lie either. The Ajachte tribe supposedly told the conquistador types that treasures and riches were stored aptly in the Meseta territory around three centuries ago. Of course, it was so that they'd fuck off and bother their rivals instead, but the prospectors did eventually find gold in the mountains. All Sid ever found was flitzbar and alabaster quartz. He kept a whole collect- I blink, staring out the window at the mountains just disappear and slope down into nothing. I squint, then I look out Chase's window in the back. Surely enough, mountains. Leo? God damn it! Leo speeds up instead of turning around though. Dude! What are you doing? TJ's clump out against my skin again as he gets that scared cat look in his eyes. Leon bumbles, mostly to himself. There's no way this leads back to Echo. No way, yeah? Leo, slow down a little. Leo takes in a seething breath. Just trust me, okay? This is getting out of hand, but I honest to God don't have a fucking better idea. I'm gonna keep going until I see that car we passed. Judging by the silence, no one has a better idea. Fuck knows I don't. Another minute of driving, more awkward silence then. Leo hisses through his teeth. Straight ahead of us, a sign. What? How in the shit? Echo Mines, Danica Entrance. That's on the other side of town. I say this as if it cannot possibly be where we're at, though there it is. It stands about eight feet tall, faded wood with this touristy Wild West font placard that the county commissioned a couple years ago. The sign's only readable because our headlights are right on it. The original solar face uh, lights have been destroyed by junkies a year ago. Leo thins his lips, driving right past it. The minutes pass and it becomes increasingly difficult to place exactly where we are. On this side of town, I can see the smoke from earlier more clearly too. The smell, like burnt charcoal, seeps into the cabin through the AC. It's like a barbecue out there. Leo lets out a worried bit of laughter though. The wolf begins to pull off to the side of the road. I'll need to flip around and go the other way again. Jenna lets out a strange sigh. It's laden with this ex exasperation, but there's a slight quiver in her vocal cords. We keep going and more time passes. Dax then mutters something I can't quite make out to Carl, who has been oddly silent, his paws over his face. I occasionally catch a glimpse of Chase looking at me from the rearview mirror. Despite this shit, with a spider bite, he looks more, well, animated than I've seen him in a long time. There's a lot less staring off into the distance and more active grimacing, muttered softcore swears, and a darting gaze. I never realized how yellow his eyes are before. Were they always that bright? More time passes, and as we round a bend, Jenna crawls halfway into the mid seat console and points ahead. That's where Duke and Chase's car was. It's not there now. How can you tell? Daxon keeps craning his neck to see past me. The corner looks familiar. But where's the car? I remember that, that thing, its silhouette was outlined against the group of pinion trees by the guardrail. 
TJ makes a whining noise. I recognize it too. There's no broken glass, tire marks, or blood, though. Absolutely no remnant of the memory to be found. God, there's nothing there. Leo speaks softly as if talking to a child. It's unclear whether he's glad or upset that the grizzly scene is straight up gone. That doesn't make any sense. Oh jeez. I look out the window. I'm just gonna watch the mountains. Let us know if they decide to flip around. He lets out a dry, terrified chuckle. Jennifer turns to her seat, her eyebrows scrunched. It's like we're stuck in some kind of loop. Heh. <sighs> Jenna gives Daxton an inquisitive look, seemingly baffled anyone could find humor in this. What? It's just, well, it's nothing. Go on, we've got time, apparently. Yeah, exactly, I mean. He exhales, shaking his head. In Ad Astra? Carl groans, his displeasure muffled by the pause over his face. Some kind of, was always the to-go line of Captain Amicus whenever he encountered something he didn't quite understand. Daxton leans his head back, his bald noggin pushing into the headrest. Some kind of alien transporter, some kind of paradox, some kind of matter replicator, some kind of reproductive goo, and so on. And this helps us how? It, well, I don't think it does, it's just sort of funny, I guess. It's like I'm in an episode with a group of wacky characters. Wacky? Huh. Jenna responds, monotone as she returns her focus to the window. I'm just really glad I'm not alone. No one speaks after that. As the truck's engine pulls us off onto another hill, I see something come into the view through the clearing of cacti. Oh, fuck me gently. Echo Mines, Danica Entrance. No. TJ whines. Leo slows down more and more until we come to a gentle stop. We sit there in silence, staring at the faded text and the gravel trail that leads into the canyon ahead. Leo starts muttering darkly to himself, looking out the window, then at the dashboard. I don't ask him if he's okay, I know what the answer is. TJ continues to make soft, whimpering sounds like he's trying not to cry. It's okay, it's just dark, and we're going off-road somehow. Leo whispers, whatever comes to mind to explain what the fuck is happening. Carl still has his head down and his paws completely quiet. He could be asleep for all I know. I think about suggesting that maybe we should just wait it out until morning in the car. But as I open my mouth, I hear a scratching sound towards the back of the car. TJ's ears perk up, which lets me know that I'm not the only one. Instinctively, I turn around in my seat. Bits of glass fly into my face and the next thing I know, I'm down in my seat, headed down with my rifle raised towards the hole. GET DOWN! Carl ducks and Jenna and TJ lurch away from their respective sides of the car, TJ accidentally opening his car door and nearly tumbling out. Close the door! Close the door! Carl manages to get a hold of the links, trying to tug him back upright as TJ cries, flaming about. I can't get a good shot, Carl's big head bobbing up and around as something moves around the outside towards the newly opened car door. A shot rings out, though not for me. A wide-eyed looking Jenna holds her smoking pistol up and fires again. The sharp crack reverberates throughout the cabin once more. Carl, very much awake now, slams TJ's door shut and screams at Leo. Go, go, go! Leo's already on it, and I feel the car jolt forward. Then I'm bouncing up and down in my seat as we go off-road, Leo not bothering with the three-point turn this time, instead going for a full U-turn. We're back on the asphalt and speeding down the road, when I feel it's safe enough to raise my head and look back up. I look out the back window. For a moment, I'm terrified that I'm going to find that thing crouched on the trunk, staring at us. But instead, all I see is a giant hole through the back window, the rem remaining glass jagged. Oh god, are you guys okay? Daxton looks back and forth between us and the road behind the van. Chase, meanwhile, looks like he's about to throw up again. His mustilla features are scrunched up in a tight grimace as he presses himself against the seat. I sit up fully, keeping my sight trained on the back. Yeah. I yell at him over the sound of the car and the wind whistling around behind me. Jenna, did you get it? I don't know. Carl is bent over his seat too, brushing glass from his hat and hoodie. I look at TJ, who's still crouched over his own seat, covering his head. Bits of glass are scattered on his back and head. I pick some of the pieces out from his fur and his neck and lean over him. TJ, are you alright? 
TJ shudders and doesn't say anything as Jenna plucks some of the shards from under his collar. What was that? Daxton shouts back at us, staring through the window. Fuck if I know. I don't want to think about what I actually think it is. I just need to be ready if it comes again. Leo keeps up the high speed, hitting some of the potholes hard enough that I'm worried we're going to get a flat. Then, we'll be in real deep shit. We drive for another five minutes in silence. And then the sign appears in front of us again. This time, no one says anything and Leo doesn't bother turning around. I watch out my window as we fly past the historic path. But nothing happens. All I see is the tall piece of wood with the broken lights, and all I hear is the wind whipping around us. Jenna keeps a paw on TJ's back as he remains hunched over, the other still holding Duke's pistol. Carl sits quietly, staring out his own window. On the bright side, the bastion back window has diminished the smell of sick, but the smoke smell is stronger than ever. Sparse dots of light show up on the horizon, indicating where Echo is. That's when Leo speaks up. Ike, that's it. We're heading back to my place, shutting off all the lights, locking the doors, and eating toaster pastries until this blows over. That's not the worst plan in the world, for sure. I ugh, guess we have to. I'd rather not meet the same fate as that other guy in the blanket, yeah? I reckon that sound. I shift myself onto my knees in the seat, the old thing creaking under my weight. I have to hunch low so that my head isn't smushed up against the ceiling. I just have to pray that Leo doesn't hit any sudden big bumps. There's a sinking feeling in my stomach at the thought of going back to Echo. Part of me wonders whether Duke and Chase's car are still there and we just imagine the whole grisly scene. I stare out my window, watching the hills move slowly by under the moonlight as we turn onto Lake Emma Road. Maybe taking one of the mountain roads out to the town would be worth it, whether we have enough gas when it happens. A crouched figure sits on the peak of a hill, just about 50 feet from where we are. I squint at it, just barely able to make out what looks like shoulders, and a head hunched up under the light of the moon. Oh shit. I'm directly across from the thing when I open my mouth, but I'm barely able to make a sound when it moves. It dashes down the hill in the blink of an eye, covering the distance between it and our car in a matter of two seconds. One moment, I'm staring at a tiny black figure, and the next, it's right up against the car, smashing into the side, between my door and Jenna's. My head smacks into the glass and I see a flash of white. At the same time, I hear Jenna shout at us to hold on, TJ screams, Carl yells. The lake. I watch as the water begins to pull in through the broken glass, the jagged glass getting carried with the flow. The van is already halfway submerged. We crash into the fucking lake. How can that be? We were nowhere near it. The water is shockingly cold and rising up to my knees. TJ yelps something incomprehensible. I see Leo thrashing with a seatbelt, trying to get unbuckled as a car battery shorts out and the cabin lights go dark. Carl! The hyperventilating ram splashes about behind. I can't open the door! I can hear the sound of the door handle being yanked. I grab my own, press the unlock button, and push outward, but the pressure of the water is too much. It doesn't budge. I try to wrangle my rifle up the butt glass, but my seat got pushed up too far to impact. I can barely move with my chest pushed up against the dashboard. Straining to wiggle free, I end up scraping my head along the roof. Piece of shit! Goddamn my stupid lanky ass. Carl, use your head! I, I don't know what to do, dude. The horns! Do the ram thing! I realize what Daxton is trying to say. Fucking specious features! Go, Carl! Uh, uh, okay. There's a shuffling of movement followed by a hard slam. Glass splatters and more water comes rushing in. There's a flurry of movement out my window as first, Jenna, Big Carl, then TJ go through the window. Soon the water's up to my nostrils and my blood goes cold. I remember my uncle telling me something after we watched a movie with a scene like this. Until the pressure is equalized, you can't open the door. It doesn't stop me from retching at the handle regardless. I push my maw up the roof and take a large breath before being fully submerged. The metal underbelly of the van scrapes against the rocks of the lake floor, which makes a downright horrifying sound underwater. With one hard push, my door finally opens and I begin to squeeze my way out. I look over my shoulder, seeing the faint outline of a rust-colored fur in the back of the van, Leo seemingly trying to get chase. My lungs begin to burn and I realize I can't see the surface. I kick my legs, trying to push myself off the slimy lake bed. 
The pressure of my eardrums are, are like drills pushing into my skull. The seconds pass. One, two, three, four, five. And finally, I breach the surface. After a moment, the water splashes and Chase and Leo emerge from the depths. Leo, I'm a fucking otter. I'm, I'm fine. Guys, guys. Carl pants, the ram appearing to be clutching one paw onto TJ's shoulder to keep afloat. He can't really swim well thanks to his hooves. TJ looks to be struggling to keep their chins both above the waterline. Where's Dude Man? What? Daxton! I don't know. Did anyone see where that thing went? We need to get out of the water. It can be here with us. I, I know it. TJ's voice sounds like a mix of whisper and a shout. Please! His voice cracks like a 12 year old as he stutters from a mixture of cold water and shock. I look around the mass of bobbing heads that surround me, but neither Dax or whatever attacked us is anywhere in sight. In fact, land is like a hundred yards away. How in the fuck? Daxton! Daxed! Carl, you need to stop yelling! Jenna's tone is hushed but firm, the wet fanic looking like a soggy mop in the moonlight. I notice a glint of steel and realize she's still holding Duke's gun. I left the mine in the lake floor. TJ's right, we need to get to shore. There's a coldness in her voice, one controlled by fear. It takes her a moment to realize what she's saying, and a horrible contortion of worry and guilt crosses her soaked features. Chase, can you get him? I don't know, I just... I don't know. No way, you're in no condition. TJ looks down, opening his mouth to speak, but nothing but whimpers escape him. Fucking hell, he's still probably all the way down in the van. We gotta get him. He's a salamander, right? I know his kind can hold their breath a little longer than we can. Yeah, I don't know why the fuck he dawdled though. Chase, you're the only fucker here who can hold their breath that long. He can barely breathe as it is, Flynn. I'll do it. I'll do it. Carl pushes himself off TJ. I'll sing like a stone anyway. Is he this fucking stupid? I swiftly dog paddle my way over, grabbing the ram's arm and forcing it around my shoulder. Yeah, you fucking will. And how's your stoned ass gonna get the both of you back up? I think I can. No way, man. Keep Chase upright for me, Flynn. The wolf rolls his shoulders forward and dives underwater. I quickly paddle over with Carl, now clinging to my back. Chase takes a hold of my outstretched hand, nervously peering into the depths below. He accepts the help, but he seems fairly alright with keeping himself afloat. We float there in silence. I try to see what's going on beneath the waves, but the visibility is frankly ass soup. Leo's never really been a stellar swimmer. Fuck, Chase wasn't even that good either, beyond not needing to come up for air for a long time. Better than me, at least. When the water gets cold, I start shutting down, I guess. My muscles are already starting to feel rubbery, and the urge for heat is strong. It's the worst in my feet, where water's deepest and in the moonlight can't reach. Fortunately, Carl and Chase are warm, the two clinging to me in silence. I can feel the ram's whiskered chin on the back of my neck and Chase's shuddering breath on my shoulders. Where at any other time, it might actually be comforting. But right now, I just hate the waiting. I hate not being able to do anything but tread water. I definitely hate not knowing what's out there in the hills or how the fuck we even got in the middle of the damn lake. Auntie's always warned me that the world is more than we perceive, that our ideas of how reality work are limited to what we have experienced prior. I ain't ever been stuck in a fucking road time loop, attacked by a pissed off electrical socket man, or launched into the middle of a lake before. So everything just kind of feels unreal. A full minute has passed now. Fuck. He should have surfaced by now. This is Leo we're talking about. He wouldn't have come up for air if he saw Dune Man just stuck down there. God, this is so stupid. Jenna, TJ, help you keep these two afloat. I'm going down. The Fennec gives me a solemn looking nod. She begins to swim over to me when what seems like a geyser of water splashes up in front of us, followed by a strained gasps for air. Daxton's blue eyes are wide, his slick form quivering in the wolf's arms. With a quick shove, the salamander jots free, and he begins to swim to shore with gasping panic. We all follow suit, though. I end up quickly behind trying to support Carl and Chase. Daxton's the first to shore, then Jenna, TJ, Leo, and finally us. All my adrenaline is completely tapped out to this point and I fall to my knees in the sand. My arms are like jello. Thanks, Flynn. Chase uncoils himself 
from me, his voice wheezy and breaks out into a raspy cough. Leo quickly hurries over, taking Chase under his arms. Easy, easy. We're safe now. The fuck we are? I peer around, even with my eyes having adjusted to the dark, I'm still having a hell of a time seeing beyond 20 yards or so. Jenna gives me a quick nod, holding up Duke's pistol to show me she still has it. The soaked Fennec would look comical were it not for the direness of the situation. She must put so much conditioner into her fur to keep that fluffy. Yeah, thanks dude. Carl proceeds to fall flat on his back, spread eagle into the sand, his hefty gut rising and falling. Yeah, well, everyone's okay at least. He, he didn't, he didn't deserve. TJ mumbles something, the lynx sitting with his arms around his knees, staring out into the lake. He makes an effort to scramble back a few feet as the tide comes in. Jenna moves over besides him, hugging the lynx from the side. Shh, we just need to get to Leo's. Leo lives on the outskirts of town by the old railway tracks. It's fairly isolated from the rest of the town. Going there is not the worst idea, but if that fucking thing could catch us in a van going 50. Fuck, I saw how it moved too, like a strobe light was being pulled on and off, and it got closer with every pulse. That is still the plan. Leo affirms with a nod, the wolf standing upright and ready. He's trying not to show his exhaustion and fear. TJ just looks at Chase now, and he's got a shimmer in his eyes. He's crying again. Chase, did Sydney? How long did he? Did he? He's cut off before he can finish. Come on, TJ, we have to go. Chase looks over at him. His expression is harder to read. He's just... weak. What? Everyone seems to be pretending they're not hearing the whimpering TJ ushering him along. I rise up to my feet, nearly tripping over myself as I get used to the solid ground again. Jenna pulls TJ up with her, trying to move the links alongside. We'll get you laid down there in a bit, Chase. I'll see what meds I've got in my cabinet. Leo also follows suit, helping Chase up the shallow incline through the loamy soil into a basin of dry grass. TJ peers back over her shoulder. He's still looking at Chase. That's when I notice a large rock with a sole pinion tree overhanging it. There's little bullet holes in, in the side of, of the trunk, 22 caliber. I made those. I look around and right where Carl's laying, I see it. The blank stare, the blue eyes. He reminded me of a fish. This is where it happened. Carl sits upright, still clearly trying to catch his breath. At first, he doesn't seem to understand, but then the realization hits him as he sees the tree. Oh shit. Carl rises up to his hooves, gawking at the tree. He's still. That thing I saw when I wrecked my car, the one that brought us here just now, it did it for a reason, you know? I mean, I used to think my house was haunted. That it comes with the territory of big spooky mansions. But maybe it's us. Carl extends out his paw to his surroundings. I assume he means the whole group. I sigh, feeling rather vulnerable out in the open without my repeater. The hysteria, it affected the whole town. Everyone goes crazy in their own way. It's what my aunt always told me. And it even got her in the end. I wonder if she's okay, or if they found some other poor schmuck to blame the end times on. Then, why are we all seeing this? He gesticulates with a swirl of his hand to the tree and the lake itself before letting his arms fall limply to the side. We're all here for a reason. We meet each other's gaze and Carl suddenly lets out a small chuckle, rubbing the space between his horns. Unless, I'm just imagining you seeing this. I let out a puff of air and rub my face. You're dreaming about me, huh? Seems like it. He shrugs. Next time, cut out the horror games before going to bed, yeah? I haven't seen a single zombie. It's bullshit. He looks towards the lake and sombers. Just kidding. Yeah. I'm not immediately sure what to say. In the distance, the group looks to be trudging through the dried up reeds and heading towards the train tracks down the pass. They're not waiting for us. Which I guess is understandable, noting Chase's condition. Carl's watching them too, though. He doesn't seem overly angsty to rejoin them. If Sid were, you know, a ghost or spirit or something, he wouldn't hurt us. Carl looks a little surprised shifting his attention back towards me. What makes you so sure? I can tell by the tone in Carl's voice that he doubts that. 
I remember Carl was really sensitive growing up, sheltered by his folks, something fierce. He'd cry and eat, and eat and cry, was basically a fat, spoiled TJ. It took me a while to figure out, and for Sid, he didn't really have much grace with the sensitive types. He was cool. I know you two never got along, but he had things rough at home. He loved hanging out with the group and all. Hell, he even thought TJ was cool. What? No way. Well, he never said as much, plain-like. He just wanted to be him, I guess. To believe God was real and had a plan. To be good without having to try so hard. To have folks who gave a shit about him. Dude, those last six months? I think back to Chase's words. I know. He wasn't himself. Not really. After a long pause, he shrugs. If you say so, I believe it. I was different then too, I guess. I was just a child, and now I'm a man-child. <laughs> I wave off the thought. At least Carl seems calmer now, or at least he's doing a good job of blocking out the terror. He's still got his tie on, though. His shirt's completely sewed through, and I can see his chest underneath when he faces the moonlight. Man, if this wasn't real... Anything you want to say to not real me? Without hesitation, Carl speaks. Not a real big fan of fishing, dude. I furrow my brow at him and sigh before beginning to trudge through the sand after the others. I can't even see them now. They must have picked up the pace. Dude. I stop. His voice is softer and apologetic. But I like when you take me out, even if it seems like I'm whining the whole time. Hmm. There's no seems like about it. You do whine the whole time. A brief, sad smile crosses his thick muzzle. You guys are still here? The salamander peers at us, worriedly. Carl and I exchange glances, then nod. Good. That's good. Um, I lost the group. I don't know where Leo's house is, and they kept walking faster, and then they just... Daxton toys with his zipper at the bottom of his hoodie. Must have gotten ahead of me. It's okay. I think we're supposed to be here. Right, dude? Carl looks at me. I cross my arms, unsure how confident I feel about this whole tapping into paranormal hunches. I... I don't know, it's just... It's a feeling. The thing could have killed us easy-like and didn't. Instead, we're here. Daxton gives Carl and I a nervous look, clearly putting a wide berth between him and the lake. Um, okay... He seems jittery, which I suppose is valid. I can't believe Leo actually rescued you, I grunt, trying to rub what feels like lake gunk out of my eyes. Why'd you even need saving? You're a natural water boy. Daxton rubs the back of his neck, his eyes flickering up as he tries to clearly recall what the fuck happened to him. I was trying to save you. His tone is concerned, the salamander peering at me as if afraid I might crumble in front of him. The hell you were? I got out of there on my own like two minutes before Leo dragged your slimy ass up from the depths. I thought I saw you. Drift off further down into the lake. You weren't moving. Anytime I tried to grab you, you just drifted further off, always with your back facing me. Eventually, I couldn't see you anymore. It was dark. He rubs his hands over his biceps rapidly, trying to warm himself. He exhales, looking briefly at Carl, then back at me. I'm sorry. I don't really understand what happened. There's not a lot going on right now. I can't really explain. That makes three of us. So where's here exactly? Where our friend died. Well, where he drowned and later died at the hospital. Carl's bluntness takes me off guard. There's no coldness in his tone though. Just the truth of it. That's terrifying. I'm sorry I asked. After a moment he speaks again. And sorry for your loss. I feel like this past week, I've just been a dingleberry on you guys. It's okay. It's cool you're here. Everyone goes quiet. Daxton occasionally looks over his shoulder to see if there's any sign that the group sent someone back for us, but no such luck. I'm starting to realize how exhausted I am. Coasting on adrenaline for an hour straight will really take the wind out of you. I lower myself first into a squat, then sit cross-legged in the sand. Despite all the... Water and vegetation, the air still feels kind of dry and smoky. I wonder where the fire's coming from. No response. I look over and Carl and Daxton are sitting together, watching the tide. They look as tired as I am. What do you want to happen here? 
Carl eventually speaks, his tone droll and somewhat monotone. I look towards the tree with all the bullet holes. I just... I just want to know what happened. They're gone? I spy the ass prints of Carl and Daxton in the sand next to me, but they're nowhere in sight. I quickly rise to my feet, hesitant to call out to them, noting what happened earlier. They move up to the top of the hill next to us, stepping through the dry grass. As I look around, I see no movement beyond the rolling tide of waves, illuminated only by the slight moonlight. Fuck! My whole plan of waiting here for something to happen seems a lot better when I had others around me. Now that I'm alone and unarmed, my gall is starting to fucking wane. They must have went to Leo's house. I mean, surely they'd fucking wake me first, right? Did I even pass out? I felt more like I just blinked and then bam, gone. For a moment, it feels like something's tugging the back of my shirt. I turn, expecting to see the bulbous face of Carl at my side, but there's no one there. Hey assholes, where are you? I let out a harsh whisper directed at the desert shrub around me. Again, no response. I sigh, rubbing my palms over my face. There's no choice. I gotta get to Leo's. My gaze drifts back to the beach and the bullet-ridden peon tree. I'm struck with a strange sense of solace, as if the spot would be somewhat tranquil to me if circumstances were different. For now, I take stock of what still in my soggy pockets. Keys, phone, dead as hell probably fried, and an old granola bar wrapper. With a gaunt, I make my way up to the beach and off towards the tr uh, rail tracks. I follow the familiar route, passing the occasional abandoned freight car. It's been about 15 minutes and so far no sight or sound of the gang or any other miscellaneous town folk. I inadvertently find myself walking up to the top of the rails and balance like a kid again. It kinda keeps the edge off and softens the noise of footsteps though it ain't very time efficient. It feels like by now I should be able to see Leo's house, but so far, nothing. It isn't until the tracks dead end perpendicular to the highway and I realize I'm being fucked with again. I stand at the edge of the pavement where the old bike lane had been overtaken by weeds, pavement crumbling to gravel. I had hoped that this specially fucking shenanigans would end once we exited the van, but goddamn, why would it? You're going the right way. The back of my skull tingles, and I cup hands over the sides of my head. That wasn't my goddamn thought. To Leo's? I ask out loud, like the fucking loony I am. I wait. No response. I clench my fists to my sides. Fuck it, fuck this. I take off in a run down the road, keeping the power lines on my right. I run mindlessly knowing damn well the nature of the loop, but trying not to think about it. I'm not usually the sort to do my running an echo on the account of the centuries worth of broken glass that lines the sides of the roads. That and for the fact that the sight of a 6 foot 7 inch gila sprinting tends to naturally raise alarms, even with folks who already know who I am. Somewhere between 30 minutes and an hour passes before I can see something ahead. I stop somewhere along the center line of the winding old highway, the cracked asphalt feeling like it's chipping away at my already blistered heels. I stare at the faded red building. My truck is parked right in the front for some reason. Why the fuck am I here? Why do you come here? The voice in my head is clearer than before, like some harsh whisper coming from inside the back of my neck and slinking its way into my head. It almost feels like I thought the words myself. Is that a fucking clue? It's a mystery. My thought was rhetorical, and hearing it respond so aptly takes me off guard. I clutch my throbbing head in both hands. I've gone full fucking schizo. When the weird shit's on the outside, it's one thing, but on the inside... I grimace, bracing myself against the gate in front of me. Gate? There's no gate in front of this place in real life. I take a closer look and I see the entire place is fenced off like some kind of high security complex. A tarnished red rebar gate is the only entrance point, my truck just on the other side. It's only about up to my chest in terms of height, though it's got a security spikes about every foot along the top. A single key lock is all that keeps each side of the gate together. It doesn't look too sturdy. 
I eyed the truck through the bars and then checked to make sure that I still have my keys in my pocket. Sure enough, I feel the familiar leather Saguro keychain between my fingers. Without even thinking, I take out my keys, flipping through the ones for City Hall. I grab the side of the lock and push in the key, twisting. To my surprise, I keep turning the, my wrist without resistance and hear a soft click as the fastening point comes unlatched. I stare at the lock, feeling some fleeting sensation of accomplishment. It soon falters as I know that the lock being there in the first place doesn't make a lick of sense. What in the fucking fuck? Also, the tips of my fingers that were grabbing the lock appear to have been stained black. Paint of some kind. Someone must have painted the lock recently, though. The fence itself still looks pretty faded. I wipe my hands off on the back of my pants and push open the gate. It only opens about six feet wide, nowhere near enough room to get my truck through. If I reverb hard and gunned it, I could probably break through it, though. I've got a feeling that that's not what I'm supposed to do. There's not really a fence in front of this place. This isn't fucking real, but I'm seeing it. So why am I seeing it? That's the fucking question, right? Duke's words from earlier come to mind. Thing is, we've all got something after us, something bad. Won't let you leave when it starts. What's after you? As if knowing would fucking help right now. If not, it would just be more confusing in the long run. I have expected the voice from earlier to speak again, but it's silent, just a dull throb in the back of my head. The smart thing to do, the logical thing, as Dax would put it, would be to sit down on a nice tree and just ride this thing out like a bad trip. Maybe get some sleep that would fix it, like turning computer off and on again. I peer up at the sky. The red lights from the building make it seem as though the sky itself was blood red and expanding to various pinkish hues in the horizon. Like fucking hell, I would get a wink in during this shit. The pounding in the back of my skull just keeps get thudding away, a constant beat that reverberates through the ha my head like a cavern. I step up to the door with the engraved bit of signage next to it. Here for the seed. That of course ain't what it usually says. That cheeky ass winging smiley face is still there though. I let out a short sigh. You fucking idiot. I turn the handle and pull, but it doesn't budge. I push next, and still nothing. The handle shouldn't turn if it's locked. I know. I've been here before when it was. I push once more, and I'm surprised that it gives the door opening. I only leave it open a crack, still a bit wary about whatever weirdness lies within. The first thing I notice is the burning smell. It's stronger than it is outside. It's hot as hell, too. If this place had a kitchen, I'd swear something was being overcooked in it. At first, it's quiet. Nothing but the creaking wood beneath my feet. Then, music starts to play. I notice the boxy television set in the corner of the room is turned on, a grainy old cricket match on the screen. It's all very much the same from what I remember, except for a lone otter sitting at the bar counter. He's holding something in his hand, an ice pack, and he's nursing some shitty import ale in his free paw. There's no one else in here but him, at least in the front area. Hey you! The otter's posture stiffens. Yeah you! Are you real? What? He responds back, his tone exasperated and groggy. Confusion. That's a, a good sign, I guess. I step a little closer, the otter using the bar counter to rotate himself into swivel bar stool. He's decked out in a skull t-shirt, cargo pants, and one of those lame scout caps that only jarhead, leather daddies, and theater kids wear. He seems dazed squinting at me in a bright light. Someone tuning up an orchestra in there? What? After a moment, something seems to click and his eyes widen slightly, a long smile crossing his snouty muzzle. Motherfucker. He pushes himself to his feet, making his way through the bar's haze. What are you doing here, you big ass bitch? He clasps my shoulders roughly then pulls me into a tight hug. For an otter, he's actually got a strong grip and I actually irk aloud as he pats my back. The fuck? What the hell are you doing? After a moment, he pulls away, raising a shadowed brow beneath his hat. It's then I notice his eyes. Baby blue, almost gray. Not a common color for his kind of otter. 
There's some bags under them, though. Like he hasn't slept in some time. I was fixing to ask you the same thing. It's been dead all night, and I wasn't expecting any company. It's kind of unreal seeing you here like this, though. It's been... He huffs, astonished, and with a slight air of sheepishness. Well, a while. He folds his arms over his chest, the other looking up at me from beneath the brim of his hat with a sort of wiry expression. He seems happy to see me. And it's all so... familiar. Wait a second. I blink. Jesus fuck, Sid? He lets out an amused noise, nodding. Yep. Wait, don't you even try to tell me that you're here by coincidence? He's an adult? Fucking six feet tall, I'd reckon. He's in shape too, rocking a full-on muscle shirt. I look around as if expecting to see Chase around a corner with a video camera and a shit-eating grin. There's still no one around but us, though. I'm sure there's a reason I'm here. He seems to perk up some, doing a one-handed finger gun gesture my way while the other nurses an ice pack against his head. Knew it. I mean, I'm glad, yeah. Did you get my Christmas package? I wasn't sure you'd like it. Saw them in the Macy Mays thrift shop in Edwom. Haunted Hacienda, Deadly Love Rivals 2, Final Obsession, The Choir Boy, and Horse Sleuth, shitty B-movies I got from the bargain bin. You know, that sort, not a lot of plot to get in the way of the film. Plus, I bumped them up with a bunch of crossfire shooting mags. Oh yeah, I also threw in some jerky I got from a trade show after my match in Desert Springs. That jerky, it's super good, hatch green chili flavored. You know that's where they grow that shit in mass, right? World capital. I can't help but stare, absolutely flabbergasted. This is what he'd look like. When I don't immediately respond, his smile dissipates some. Maybe you didn't get it. Fucking delivery guys, right? Probably some weasel or something with a good smeller. He honks his own black nose. Pinning for my jerky. Am I fucking dreaming right now? Am I asleep or just tripping? The otter, Sydney. He's looking at me more worriedly. You, uh, wanna sit down or something? Uh... I look around at the still empty bar. Assad or not, my legs are killing me. Sure. He motions towards one of the old wooden and velvet bar stools next to the raised table in the corner, and we take our seats. After Sydney grabs his drink, of course. I don't know where the bartender went. He's usually in the back. I look towards the smoke room door. Nothing seems to have changed about it. He? Yeah, he. Big tiger fella. Only guy who works here, as far as I know. He scrunches his brow, thinking him for a moment. Unless he got a sex and species change to become a bleach blonde bunny with big bouncing tits, I don't think so. I grunt. What the hell is he talking about? He was into dressing up in chick panties, but I don't think we're talking about the same person. Or same bar. Sid snarks, looking at me a little wide-eyed. Thinking of one of your gay bars, right? The fuck are you talking about? This is the gayest bar in the state. If this were real, there'd be 20 fucking dudes rimming each other behind the door as we speak, including the bartender. I point to the familiar, no smoking label door, my tone more firm now. Including you? His comment has a derisive, teasing tone. After a second, he blinks, looking back over his shoulder to see what I'm pointing at. You've been porking guys to go to clown school? That's a goddamn tiny janitor's closet. Says so on the door. I squint at the door. For a brief, fleeting moment, I can almost quite make out the little mop and bucket symbol posted in the center. But it's simply not there. I honestly don't know why I came here tonight. I guess I just had a good feeling about it in my gut. And by that I mean I saw the picture outside for their chipotle dusted beard nuts and my stomach got a boner. And I guess it also worked out since I got to see you. He thrusts his arms towards me, trying to put on a cheeky, sarcastic grin, like he's trying to play off the statement as he realizes how sappy it sounds. There, to my knowledge, has never been advertisements for spicy beer nuts posted outside of the bar here. Jesus. I slowly lean back into my chair, letting out a long exhale. It's really good to see you two, more so than you probably know. He opens his muzzle to speak again, but I cut him off. Sid. Where do you think we are? He takes a swig from his beer, peering at me for a long moment before examining his surroundings. It's, uh, you know... He snaps his fingers a few times. The beer nut place? He frowns, 
shifting his ice pack back to his noggin. Fuck, I'm not that sauced. I just hit my head real hard on the counter when I was bending over to pick up my phone. Shit, do we have plans to meet here? I genuinely don't fucking know. I sure as fuck didn't. No. I trail off for a moment, swallowing away the tight feeling in the back of my throat. I pull my phone from my pocket, turning it over in my hand, still dead. I wasn't expecting to ever see you again. His blue eyes widen, the other giving me that same doe-eyed look he'd give me after we'd been hanging out and I'd say I have to go. I never wanted to go home. But look, I know after I bailed on the interview you set up for me, you were pretty pissed. Rightfully so, too. Fully justified. I get that. I know. I fucked up. What? I'm trying to get clean. I swear to shit. It's just... So fucking hard, you know? You're on drugs? No, I mean, not right now. I'm sober as fuck. I look at the ale in his paw. Sands the booze. Ugh. Look, all the other guys I wrestle with at the road shows, though, they're all on that shit. Everyone's been trying to bulk up and stuff so they actually get a pop when the crowd sees them. His tone is completely defensive, the otter looking me straight in the eyes, searching for any sign of doubt. There's this one guy, Cody Altaro, or, well, he goes by the name Rico Renaissance now. He's been getting booked as my rival, and the bastard's up 25 pounds in two months. 25 fucking pounds, no way is he fucking doing that with chicken breast and protein shakes. Wait, 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 you're telling me you wrestle for a living? That would explain the muscle shirt and those tacky ass wristbands. Like, that's your actual goddamn job? Cindy leans back some, still peering at me with that same searching look. Yeah, you used to go to my shows all the time. SFF? Sunday fun day fights? It's mainly fucking juggalos and shit now, and we get paid in pennies and grass, but, you know, it's a start and tough. He sniffs, eyes drifting down to his arms on the sticky table surface. He doesn't seem grossed out by it. Ryan told me they never clean up the front anymore. Said not to touch the underside of the table, since they're probably packed solid with two things. Gum and cum. <laughs> I notice patchy areas in the fur near his inner elbows, and it takes me a moment to register. He's got fucking injection marks. He seems to see me staring and pulls back his arms. I gawk at him for a moment, Sydney bracing himself for whatever I'm about to say. It gives me a sinking feeling in my gut, but it makes sense. With the shit Sydney dealt with growing up, every sign was pointing towards him getting some sort of chemical addiction down the road. It ain't just roids, is it? Heh, <laughs> yeah, well, you know me. It's, I take some shit for, you know, the mental stuff. Mental stuff? I'm assuming it ain't prescription. You assume correctly. He speaks slowly, twiddling his thumbs on his lap, his eyes dancing from the bottle in front of him to me, and back again. I'm not sure what to say, we sort of just sit there in awkward silence. I know you never really understood all the fucky stuff going on in my head. I just... I want to thank you for sticking around as long as you did. Can't say the same for anyone else. I'm not really an easy person to have the back of, especially when I'm one person one minute, and another the next. I remember that shit Chase was talking about earlier, about the incident at the ice cream place in Pueblo. The way he just clicked and changed. He continues speaking, the otter shifting his thick tail listlessly behind him. And tell your roommate Dax thanks as well. I know y'all tried really hard to get me that stable job at the print shop, but fuck, it would have been never worked out if schizo like me can't hold a position like that. Instead of Carl, Cindy was the one I would have been helping. I realize he's still out there, caught up in all that hysteria without me while I'm stuck in this place. Sid, this isn't real. The otter gives me another strange look. He clearly was expecting me to be acting much different than I am now. Like he'd been preparing to speak to me for some time now and had completely derailed his plans to get a lot of the shit he wanted to say off his chest. You're not real. I'm just... I'm fucking dreaming this right now. I thought you couldn't dream. You used to get annoyed as hell with me when I'd go off about the shit I'd dream about. Yeah, well, I am now. How would you even know that this is a dream if you've never had one? After all, you look more like you just woke up. I shake my head, watching the blurry brown and black form in front of me shift from side to side. I keep expecting him to just not be there when my vision refocuses. Look, let me just... 
lay the shit out plain like. You can't be here. You're dead. You drowned over a decade ago in Lake Emma. I think Chase did it, or at least I think he did. Sydney looks uncomfortable, as if the slight semblance that this is all some sort of elaborate, fun ruse I'm pulling on him is looking increasingly unlikely. Okay, um, well that didn't happen, no nuts. And Chase, that twink couldn't hurt a fly. He sighs, rotating his half empty bottle of pale on the table and smearing the ring of condensation that forms beneath it. I'm right fucking here and I just want to talk to you. His tone turns terse, hurt even. No shit, bird, you died. TJ saw two bodies with brown fur writhing in the water before you drowned. They all thought you died on your own somehow, like you passed out or some shit, but I knew better. I see a flicker of realization in Sydney's eyes, and again he shifts uncomfortably. I think... I think I remember what you're talking about. But I'm not dead. I'm here. Motherfucker, feel me! He reaches across the table and takes my wrists, squeezing hard. It's like he's trying to give me an Indian burn, like he used to. I yank back my hand. Fuck off! He stares wide-eyed at me, his maw slightly agape. A moment passes before he speaks again. Why are you acting like this? Like you can't fucking just enjoy the goddamn company. Plus you're so damn intense. You're not even high right now. This isn't fucking real. I'm your goddamn best friend. Hell, you're like my gay scaly brother. You can't fuck with me like this. This is too real. I quickly shake my head, closing my eyes. You're dealing with me right now and not the thing inside your head. And that's fucking becoming a rare and rarer thing these days, so I'm just really trying to enjoy what time I've got. Just... just talk to me. I don't want to think. He trails off, staring down at his lap. Think about what? There it is. The change. The music seems to sound further and further away until it dissipates entirely. Huh. Maybe you're right, Flynn. What the fuck are you talking about? The sick heat left forgotten in conversation begins crawling up my back. Grabbing onto the table to help maintain my own posture, it's clear that something has shifted. The little bit of light in Sydney's eyes, just gone. Two bodies. What? Two bodies, right? I remember now. Man, that shit fucking sucked, didn't it? Shifting uncomfortably, the topic had reversed onto what he had previously denied. Two bodies, Sid. You're fucking dead. I saw you. I looked you in the face and saw nothing. I gripped the edge of my seat, my gut feeling like it's twisting in on itself. It's like I'm standing in front of a roaring fireplace, the smell of smoke and fresh ash licking my nostrils while the heat tickles my scales. Sydney's gone forever, and all that's left is this. Who are you? It feels different to me. The thing that isn't Sydney looks around. This is not the smoke room. It looks like it is, but not to me. The otter continues to stare off into the side before seeming to realize I asked a question. Sam. I am Sam. While he speaks, he points towards you, across the table with both hands. There's something metal in its grip, long and with a barbed end. I can't make it out what it is exactly. I swallow and try to speak evenly. Who's Sam? A facsimile of a person that was. I'm dabbing myself with ink so I never dry, but it smudges. A simulation. In here, I become we with you. Me? Pod plus, no. I'm not sure I hear the first part correctly. At first, they came through the gate. Then they came through the stars. There's a pause. Did they come for you? He looks at me and I feel my legs begin to shake. I tremble, wishing I was anywhere but here. The others before. They bounce, undulating in constant, restless motion. 
The hollow figure heaves, breathing heavily as he sways Sydney's body up and down. He stares at me with eyes that remind me of the fish Carl and I catch at the pond. But that's not what you want. You want the answers. After all, it's a bit late for love, and two still for lust. I... I just fucking need to know what happened. To Sydney, so that this hysteria stops and that everyone is safe again. That could help. But are you sure you really want to know? You can't chase the truth until you're red in the face. The thing looks over towards the smoke room door, but was once Sydney raises his arms to point at it with unnatural, stuttery movements. It ebbs and flows like the tide. You can ride it. Each time the tide comes in, it's a little less of what it was, was abstracted. It goes where sorrow sprouts and takes with it what it can before rolling back out. Some tides are particularly large. He waves a blurred paw at me, and again I see the metal thing grasped in his paws. He seems to see me looking at it and holds it out in front of me. You burn them all down around you until only the truth remains. You needn't the superfluous kindling, for those are but the lies they tell others, and eventually themselves. You'd make a good detective if you weren't marinating in your own nepotist squalor. Unlovable, shameful, a sin to all those who initially cared for you. Truly only belonging amongst the sawdust, semen, and ash. Thoughts drowned out amidst the moaning and groaning of unfamiliar shadows. The only one who precisely knew you, who precisely loved you, ushered into the tide by those you thought fondly of. And justice denied again and again and again. He presses the barbed tip of the rod into the table. There were six, and now there's five. The distorted otter is looking at the thing in his grasp as he says this. It's a fire poker. I hesitate to speak, my mouth feeling dry and my forked tongue caught between my teeth. Yeah, I get it, but... Well, what I just saw with Sydney, was that real? It could be. Somewhere in here. He seems to be referring to the poker. I reach for it, but my hand can't quite touch the metal. It phases right through it. The hollow thing just stares at me, watching my futile attempt. Slowly, I rise to my feet, my legs gelatin-like as I wobble some. I manage to steady myself with my tail, grasping the sticky table for support. The distorted otter just watches me, somehow looking almost eager. With no small amount of trepidation, I begin approaching the smoke room door, the sound of crackling flames growing louder the closer I get. This has to be it. The alternative being doing nothing which, while real damn appealing, probably wouldn't stop what's going on outside. If that's how this works, that is. I grasp the handle. Fuck me. Many have. I stop looking back over my shoulder. The figure is leering closer now. Fuck you too. As I turn back to face the door, I swear I see the shape smile. I turn the knob and step inside. The air is absolutely electric, and I feel myself involuntarily shiver. I brace myself against the wood side walls, staring through the darkness. I've never seen it this empty before, and I get the sensation in my gut that something terrible happened here. Looking back, I don't think the shape followed me. I'm still here. God damn it, leave me alone! I feel my blood chill, but I keep moving. Just ignore it. Just ignore it. Just ignore it. This version of the smoke room is impossibly large. I keep walking through the darkness, expecting to reach an end, but it doesn't happen. It just keeps looping in on itself. I don't even know what I'm supposed to be looking for. I hear a sharp crack, a gunshot, followed by a low cry. Someone's wailing. It doesn't sound like it's coming from inside, but rather a reverberating noise outside far away. The whole room begins to vibrate, as if activated. The rumbling, it's stronger on one side of the room. I walk in that direction. 
As I approach, I hear more wailing, more voices, some sounding different and rather close. Flynn! Now there's huffing and panting, the sound of hooves and soft feet upon the stone floor. They're trying to catch up to me at the other end of the long, cavernous hallway. The rebar from before. Jesus, this is not the smoke room. I'm in the mines. And it's very, very hot. I feel my whole body rumble like shock waves of bouncing on my insides. Kinetic energy, electricity, like a thousand subwoofers rever reverberating from stone walls. We're here. The source. The seed. Dude! S stay back! Initially, it's like a cold shower, an icy sensation that presses against my front and washes over me like a tide. I recoil, but there's no over to withdraw back to. At first, measure my body is unable to discern the extreme cold from extreme heat, though that time soon passes and the burning feels all too real. I can feel it seep in between the cracks of my scales and look at the more vulnerable flesh beneath. I'm standing in fire, but I don't see it. I see nothing. I can't even tell where it's coming from. Wherever I go, the burning follows. The fabric of my clothes rips and the seams begin to snap away. Some of it falls to the floor while the rest clings to my body like new skin. Even the air I breathe burns, making my insides boil. This isn't in my head. This is real. I'm burning. I flail into the darkness, running now. After a while, it feels like I'm practically gliding. I hear a sound and move towards it. Fucking help me! I utter, my voice raspy and light. Footsteps. There are several of them and a bonfire. I see the silhouette of people running, flailing about just like me. Panic everywhere. A woman, Genevieve Sanders, the mail carrier, is standing above the fire. A gun is in her hands. Salem's body is burning. And besides her is Auntie, face down with a bloody hole in the back of her head. No! I pinch myself trying to wake up. I pinch so hard I feel the scales in my arms split in half and blood that seems like it's boiling pools from it. It quickly evaporates and all that's left is a mark of reddish pink flesh beneath, scar tissue. I look up and she's still standing there, mouth agape, like she's frozen, but her eyes follow me in the real time. She sees me, but it's not like she can't act. Why? Fucking why? I receive no answer from the horrid visage. She's still holding the gun. She'll do it again. She'll do it again. I lunge, and it's like she's made of sand, flesh dissolving away beneath my claws as I touch her. And then, it's like a rope wraps around my waist and yanks me back. The wind is like sandpaper against my burning head as I fly through the blurred shapes and silhouettes. What I do? Was that real? Oh god, auntie. Jesus fuck, what's happening? Next thing I know, I'm in front of the city hall again. Though, everything's different. There's a crowd gathered around a large tree outside, and their clothes are all old-timey-like. Men in suspenders, women in prairie blouses. Their faces are furious blurs, polygonal masses of fur and teeth that seem to exude their emotion more strongly than their distant facial features. A Meseta Fennec stands upon a wooden stool with a noose wrapped around his neck, the priest next to him reading his last rites. The man is so angry, so hurt, tears like waterfalls down his matted yellow cheeks. Someone hurls a piece of hardtack that hits him square in the jaw, but he doesn't react. The cries of the crowd are obscured, distorted, something about a child or children. There's a man on the edge of the crowd, a ram. The one the Fennec is staring at. He looks like Carl. The ram pivots on his hooves, turning to walk away, but stops when he sees me, his expression vacant. The Fennec shouts indiscernible hatred at the man, and just then the stool is kicked out from beneath him. As he sways, feet kicking and dribbles of piss cascade down his overalls, it's as if the ground itself begins to bounce. It's something so palpable and awful that it's beyond words that I can't feel within my mind more readily 
than the burning of my flesh. The stony faces of the mob seem completely unaware that their actions are feeding something far greater than they will ever know. I'm sucked away again and feel my scales fall from my body like black and orange confetti. My thudding heartbeat is becoming increasingly irregular. I'm standing behind a shelf now. There's someone in a hoodie next to me, but he doesn't notice I'm here. He's got a camcorder. I think it's... it's Salem? He's younger. A large bear, larger than me by a couple inches, steps out from what looks like the bathroom door. It's Brian, meth dealer who lives in the trailer on the outskirts of the old city limits. I see him at the smoke room sometimes. He deals there. Neither of them are looking in my direction. I soon see why. There's a fennec on what looks like a rack nearby. One of his eyeballs is gone, but he's still alive. On the television behind, a slideshow of grotesque images flash by one of the fennec's missing eyes on the smoke room counter. It looks like the place was closed, so nobody could walk in and see what they were doing. In the real world, the fennec's words are garbled and distorted, as if coming from an old VHS. He's feigning love for the bear, asking him to hold him tender-like instead of whatever else he has planned. The fennec's face becomes increasingly blurry. Is that Danny? Casey? Keith? There were so many. They blurred together. Salem's grinning, the reflection on his camcorder screen leaving a stark glint in his eyes. I feel myself move out from behind the shelf, beyond my own will. There's a rumbling pull in my gut. I'll be pulled away any moment now. Brian sees me, his eyes going so large as saucers. They're real, is all he can get out before my hands pass through his gut. The hairy flesh seems like it practically disintegrates in my fingertips until I notice that it's all splattered on the walls besides me. As I'm pulled away, I can just make out the tusked, smiling face of Salem. It's full of shock, but the smile remains, and so does the maimed fennec. I gasp into the void, the flesh, blood, mixing with my own. My actions no longer feel entirely of my own volition. It's like something pulling in my skull. Like back to City Hall, when I condemned Chase. We make the justice. We're given. I pop back in front of the familiar ram and salamander, like all that had happened was just some horrible vision but my body feels the same, and gaping expressions of the duo show no sign of relief. Caw! I can barely make the noise with my throat the way it is. I can practically feel my vocal cords snap away as I speak, letting me only exude a guttural growl. I reach out to him, seeing in the sinewy red appendage my arm has become. <sighs> the tunnel shakes around me. Carl and Dax both turn and flee. The salamander screams his absolute lungs out. I'm terrifying to them. As they're about to round the corner, I see Carl hesitate. He looks back to me. I can't see his expression, and I can't call out to him. I have to let him know I'm still here. With some strained effort, I turn my wrist around and close, in all but one of my fingers. The ram continues to stare at the rumbling increases. I pull away once more. It goes on like this. At each stop, I lose more of myself, mentally and physically. Each visage that appears before me, some new unspeakable evil I hadn't fathomed existed. From time to time, I let the thing inside my head take more and more control. Sometimes, I don't have the control in the first place when the suffering is the strongest. Where Sam thrives, he drives. Like my body, I become numb. All but my vision and hearing is gone, and they're swiftly fading too. I keep closing my eyes, waiting for it to end. But it doesn't. I can't die. I hear the soft pitter of feet on a rocky embankment. Somewhere down the way, stones are being skipped. Clap. Someone threw a big one. Then sniffling, followed by a low sob. Crying has become so familiar to me, I hear it more than anything else. It feels like... It's like singing, isn't it? Purest expression of emotion. Fuck you. 
But this one, this one is more familiar to me as well. I can just make out the audible sound of little pebbles rolling down a hill, followed by a heavy thud. I turn to see a faint gray silhouette with big blue eyes. What? Why? The voice hits me like electricity. This is it. This is what he saw that day on the beach by the outlet. Finally. He screams. He, they always scream. I have to follow him. I have to see it. I descend below the waves and I see excess fat drift from my body into the tidal current. The water is abrasive, but I'm able to glide through it, swimming without swimming. Something pops and suddenly I can't see from my left eye. There's white water ahead, thrashing movement. A slight bit of reddish pink mist solves in the current in front of me. No. No! I strain myself to hear, trying to keep absolutely still. But other than the faint occasional splash, there's nothing. Eventually, the splashing stops, and I know my best friend is dead. I rest in the current, and the voice in my mind is fortuitously silent, not pressing me into movement or action. And though my eyesight is gone, my skull punctuated with nothing but empty sockets and orifice, I see something. Bright blue eyes and starry skin. It's Daxton. I'm sure of it. He doesn't move, though I can read the intent in his eyes that he very much wants to. Instead, he remains motionless, and we stare at each other. I imagine speaking to him, telling him what's happened to me. My words are ramblings, my mind not what it used to be, but it doesn't seem to matter. He meets my gaze regardless. I ask him if Carl's all right, and of course he doesn't respond. I then simply state that I hope he's okay. I go on and tell him about all the crap that the ram had been through, about how much I hope he fucking makes it out decently enough. I'm sure they'll give him another shot at the interview on account of the town-wide badness. I tell him I hope it's over now, whatever, wherever he is. And finally, I apologize for what an absolute ass I was to him when he deserved goddamn none of my angsty bullshit. He never shows any indication of understanding or even blinking. Most surprisingly of all, it feels as though hours pass and the hysteria simply holds on, whisking me away. No rumbling, on, no fire, no screeches into sudden chaos. Just a slow, eventual feeling of drifting away somewhere else, somewhere dry. There's a telltale sound of hot water heater rumbling nearby. It's humming away. Someone must be taking a shower, or it's laundry day. I feel the vibrations more than I actually hear the thing. Then, a faint whimper. The sound is stifled, as if the upset individual is trying to hold back tears. It's high pitch, Feminine. A girl. The distortion is only slight. I bring my hand up and feel wooden slates, and when I push harder, the whole surface bends and folds outward. It's a closet door. The sniffling stops. Slowly, I hold up my hand and do a small wave. Gentle movements as I'm sure the distortion is making it look faster. It's quiet. All I can hear is the water heater in the girl's room. There's the shuffling of sheets, then small footsteps. Hi. Her voice is timid. There's another long pause. Are you real? I think for a moment. Then slowly, I shake my head.
five years later. Seriously, this is going to be such a good fucking time. You'll be glad you came. The big grizzly bear nudges the coyote playfully, almost knocking the canine into the passenger window. Ow, keep your paws on the wheels, or your paw at least. Cameron eyes the giant half-eaten burger and the bear's equally giant paw. Deb's other paw casually steers the wheel, elbow resting through the open window. The bear looks happier than he's been in a while, somehow grinning as he chews. The coyote sighs and stares out his own window, watching the desert landscape fly by. It was nothing like this in his hometown, and he found himself wishing he was back amongst the pine forests. Something he'd been wishing since he moved to Pueblo for school. Technically, this was his natural habitat, but he found this whole place depressing somehow. Empty and dry and rough. Whatcha pouting for? I'm not pouting. Yeah, you are. Cameron sighs, deciding to change his subject. So, why couldn't Larry go again? I don't know. Said something about his car breaking down. I think he just flaked, though. Aren't there other haunted places in Pueblo that we could have gone to, like, by the school? The bear shakes his head, letting go of the wheel to crumble up the foil that he had packed his sandwich in, tossing it to the back. Not like Echo, dude. This place is the most haunted place in the entire fucking world. Cameron sighs once again, then suddenly grasps his seat as the car swerves and turns onto the smaller road, heading towards a big blue lake. What the fuck? Whoops, sorry, I almost missed the turn. The drive continues and eventually the map on the dash chimes, indicating that they've reached their destination. Why? Because a lot of shit happened here. The grizzly hops out of the car and making the entire thing tilt sideways as he squeezes his bulk out before reaching back into for the camera bag. He takes out his small, compact camcorder from the inside and wraps it around his wrist. He flicks a switch, and Cameron sees that familiar red recording light flash. He points the lens at the coyote, and he quickly covers his face, letting out a frustrated sigh. I'm not the horror you're after, Dev. And with that, he unbuckles and slides out the car. The bear waits for him, reaching out a large padded paw. Cameron takes it and is immediately drawn into a tight embrace and a kiss. The coyote tenses up for a moment, then waits until Dev releases him. Ugh, can you not do that right after you eat a big greasy hamburger? Cameron makes a show of wiping his lips. Devin rolls his eyes. No pleasing you, is there? Nevertheless, the grizzly holds out his paw again and Cameron takes it, the two of them walking towards the town center. It's not a pleasant walk. Most of the infrastructure is in a pretty shoddy condition, overgrown in places sagebrush and dry vegetation. So where are we meeting this guy? I told you, the old civic building. Wait, you mean City Hall? Cameron recalls a late night rants with Devin over the phone, the bear regaling every last detail of the incident. Where they shot the mayor? Yep. The coyote releases his paw from the larger, clawed grip of his boyfriend peering up at him with the slightly wider eyes. Damn, are you absolutely sure he's okay with this? Yeah, look, he's the one who did the report on this town after what happened in the first place. Devin tries to put on a reassuring smile. He seems keenly aware that the folks sometimes find this large predator grin unnerving, but Cameron always told him it was cute. And he's gay, so you know. The bear rewraps his paw around Cameron's own. No need to be worried about that. Eventually, the two reach the old town center. Sure enough, there's a man standing in the gravel parking lot with his paws in his pockets. He doesn't appear to notice the two at first, and Devin takes the opportunity to film him from afar. The sun's behind him, so it casts his front in a shadowed silhouette, giving him an eerie visage which he might be able to use in the video. The civic building's roof is fully collapsed, a faded gray tarp over the top of the walls, all it's protecting the interior. Like most of the structures they passed on the way in, a laminated notice of condemnation stacked with the county seal is posted in the front door. After about 15 seconds or so, it's fairly clear the older guy is aware of the two college kids' presence as he cats his head in their direction. They quickly shuffle up, wearing sheepish smiles and already sweat-stained clothing. Uh, Chase? Yo. Hi. The bearded otter seems to be looking at their held paws, which they quickly unclasp, and shakes his own head in 
In turn, he offers them a sort of melancholy smile. You two been together long? Oh, heh, sorta. The coyote rubs the back of his neck, the bear wrapping an arm around his shoulder. Yep, a while. Must have been tough growing up in the sticks out here. For a gay guy, I mean. Especially. Chase lets out a little amused grunt, reaching into his pocket and withdrawing a pack of cigarettes. Eh, uh, I guess? I mean, I did have a boyfriend growing up here for a while, so I friggin' lucked out here. If I recall, he's the one that helped you out during the incident, right? Leon? Leo. Right. He quickly nods, muttering something about how he should know that before adjusting the camera on his shoulder. How's he doing? I don't know, he doesn't really talk to me anymore. Oh, well, regardless, it must have been tough being the only gay kids out here growing up. Yeah, us and one other guy. He sniffs, looking off to the side. Y'all mind if I smoke? Oh, uh, go ahead. Yeah, plenty of fresh air here, I don't mind. The otter nods, sticking the cigarette between his lips and flicking his lighter. However, he doesn't bring the flame up, instead just holds it up out in front of him. The seconds pass, and slowly he shifts the lighter in the direction of the old civic building. Cameron and Dev watch the uh, otter expectantly after everything he's been through, some oddball behavior is to be expected after all. So, I'm a big fan of your original report you did. Hell, I did my own little video on what happened when I was first starting my channel. I know, you used a lot of my footage. Devin begins to look a little nervous, laughing some to try and lighten the mood. I credited you, of course. Um, just some haunting vlogger. You're like a professional journalist and everything. Chase finally lights his cigarette. Was. Huh? Was a professional journalist. I got pushed out of my reporting gig in KGUA like two years ago now. No one liked my stuff anymore. No matter what I did, it wasn't ever as good as that piece I finished in college. Devin blinks. Um, sorry to hear that. He pauses, thinking to himself for a moment. You know, those news media companies are all fascist shit factories anyway. Dev? Without all that big billionaire funding, they'll be going the way of the dinosaurs, relegated to sports and weather for senior citizens. Chase stares blankly up at the much taller bear, unsure of how to respond to that. Dev clears his throat. And, uh, your social media profile said you were still. I haven't updated that in a while. Ah. Chase takes a long drive from his cigarette, stopping at his first speed bump. He seems to become increasingly aware of the uneasy stares from the two college kids in front of him. Sorry, it's been a difficult few years for me. The statement from the otter makes sense, looking at him now. He's awfully haggard for someone in his mid to late twenties, his facial scruff untrimmed, and the dye job looking a little less than stellar. <laughs> Cameron can't help but think he'd be kind of cute if he cleaned himself up a bit. Or perhaps he just has a thing for sad eyes. Set sad eyes were fixed upon the civic building now, Chase's lips thinning tightly around his cigarette, squeezing ash from the tip. The coyote steps up, placing a paw on the otter's shoulder. Hey, it's alright. We don't want to put any pressure on you. Right, Dev? Right. Dev sounds genuinely supportive. Chase can see why Cameron might be taken with him so much. It would be nice to have something like that again, and he finds himself relishing the paw on his shoulder. He didn't realize he was so touch-starved. Still, Chase can't help but to avoid their reassuring gazes, the otter rubbing at the old spider bite mark on his neck. Let's, uh, let's begin, shall we? To be continued. Hopefully in arches, because I don't know if I can wait for more Flynn content. But anyways, this is the end of Flynn's route. Uh, but yeah, there's a lot that happened there. And we saw that Flynn became that thing that everybody was seeing, the quote-unquote Wendigo, or socket-faced man, if you will. And yeah, it's kind of sad what happened to him, because he only wanted the truth, but I guess in the end, the truth really... I guess, no, actually, he was denied the truth, even becoming that thing. But, oh well. So sorry, Flynn. Your obsession turned you into a monster, basically. 
and I guess we'll we've seen a little glimpse of old Chase who went on to have a journalism career that ended kind of badly because I guess he couldn't really do anything much other than the report he did on Echo and um, I don't know if Leo is still here in Echo or if he's back living with his parents and Peyton I don't recall because this ends kind of how uh, Carl's and Leo's endings end, where they all manage to get out safely, well, with the exception of um, Flynn, obviously. But um, it doesn't end quite the same, because I think Chase and Carl do go back to um, Pueblo and finish you know, their respective careers. And I don't know if Leo leaves Echo, or I don't know. We'll have to see in Arches, because I think, to me, this at least feels like the actual ending, not like all the other routes. The All, all the other routes give you like a different perspective depending on who you go with. But this one seems more like the intended route, because it even says to be continued. And it even has little bits and pieces when Flynn becomes the Wendigo that show that it's kind of connected to everybody's, you know, route. Yeah, because he is actually the thing that Carl sees in the car when he crashes, when he was on acid. And he's the thing that visits Jenna when she's sad. And I'm not sure if he is the thing that keeps people from leaving Echo during the whole hysteria thing. But I guess all our questions will have to be answered when Arches comes out. Or if Flynn's route gets more, you know, stuff, which I doubt. But oh well. We'll have to see. And uh, anyways, uh, thank you for listening. And if you want to play Echo and or any of the other Echo Project games, there's will be links in the description. And feel free to support them on Patreon. I will see. Maybe I might do a little bit of Jenna's route. Uh, I don't know. I don't know yet because I kind of need a break. My my eyes hurt right now from so much reading. Uh, but yes. Uh, bye bye.